right. Hello. I'm Malte. Um, I'm actually a postdoc at MIT, which is you know just down the road, so it's a quick walk over here. Um, and I'll be presenting about cluster schedulers today, which is what uh, my research is focused on in the last couple of years. And Yonel here will be uh, helping me, um, and we'll take uh, some of the presentation. We work together on this project called Firmament that I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, Yonel is currently a, a finishing PhD student at the University of Cambridge over in the UK, which is where I also did my PhD. So without, you know, sort of... Uh, Further pretext. Let's let's get started. So you know we we're all here to talk about you know containers to learn about you know how to manage them, how to work with them, and typically you know a container orchestration system or a cluster manager or whatever you want to call it looks you know sort of in a very simplified way a little bit like this. Um, you know you have some machines, um, you have a bunch of agents on each machine um, that run there that report back to some centralized. Uh, orchestration system or cluster manager to uh, to say what's up on these uh, cluster machines. And in that uh, centralized cluster manager, uh, you typically have some bits of UI that you know allow you to actually manage your stuff. Um, you have some monitoring, something like C-Advisor or Datadog or Sysdig or some one of these other things that feed into your cluster management system. And of course, the cluster manager also keeps track of machine status. So you know, if a machine fails, then it realizes that and reschedules the containers. And it also keeps track of task status. Um, in this presentation, I'll say task, and you can sort of think, you know, what I mean is container. The reason I say task is because a bunch of the academic literature that I will talk about refers to refers to tasks, but you know you can see you can see read that as pod or container or you know whatever you, your your cluster manager's favorite terminology is. Um, and then one other crucial component, and that's the one that we'll be focusing on in this presentation, is is the scheduler, which is the bit of the cluster manager that actually decides where your containers get to run, um, you know what containers end up next to them, whether they get moved around, and all those sorts of things. Um, and in fact, you know, user containers when they come in, when you uh, specify a new deployment or a new job, you know, they they arrive ultimately at the at the scheduler before the scheduler has done its work. You know, nothing happens; your container can't start running. But the other important part of the scheduler is is actually the crucial component for getting good utility out of your cluster manager because it is the key to getting high utilization. You can throw a lot of work at a cluster and you can easily fill it up, but you will get super poor performance if your scheduler is not doing a good job. And then what happens typically is you know you go oh man you know I have super poor performance so you over provision your resources you underutilize your resources and you waste a bunch of money. Um, so with that sort of uh, you know as uh, setting the scene let's let's see what we'll cover in, in this talk. Um, first of all I'll talk a little bit about cluster scheduling uh, in general give sort of an overview both looking at you know industrial systems as well as you know academic research what the state of the art is. Um, what the future will bring, you know, what features we would like to have in the or in current orchestration systems that aren't there yet, um, and that's going to be sort of an introduction to, you know, a bunch of the problems that we will solve with Firmament, which is the the system that we've developed in in our research. Um, I'll explain together with you now how it works, um, and also show you how you can try it out today, um, which is very exciting because. You know, this has never been presented before, and it's never been exposed to other people to try it before. So, you know, you're experiencing a premiere here. Um, all right. So, you know, why why does the scheduling stuff matter? I, I've already told you. You know, it's the key to high utilization. Um, and why do you want high utilization? Because you want to share your infrastructure. You have a bunch of machines. Um, if you just dedicate a, a machine to your database, a machine to your batch processing, a machine to you know, various other things that you want to do, you're going to probably underutilize the machines. This is the same story as VM consolidation back in the 2000s, um, just, you know, all over again. You want to utilize your hardware efficiently, so you want to share it between different types of workloads. Now, in theory, by doing this, by just, you know, packing your machines tightly, you're going to get super high utilization. Everything is going to work out perfectly. You're going to save a bunch of money. You know, save on CapEx. You don't have to buy new machines. Save on OpEx. You, don't, you know, you can have fewer people to run them. But in practice, actually, uh, there are lots of things that happen that mean that this sort of promise does not quite come true. Um, one big problem is co-location interference between different containers. So if you have two things that are hitting the disk or that are hitting the network, your, your performance can suffer quite substantially. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as noisy neighbors as well. Um, you also get machine heterogeneity. Not all of your machines are the same. Typically, you have multiple generations of machines in your cluster, and their performance characteristics are actually different. And as a result, people tend to over-provision and end up with low machine utilization again. 
Um, so, you know, the whole promise of a cluster manager that it will make everything more efficient and therefore cheaper, you know, may actually fail to materialize because of bad scheduling. Um, and in fact, if you look at some uh, some industry statistics that uh, you know uh, have been published over the last couple of years, it's actually shocking how low utilization is in practice in, in a lot of these things. So there's a paper in ASPOS 2014 that analyzed a Twitter uh, cluster and found that its utilization is around 20%. Um, there's some very low numbers on EC2 that some people found. Now, Amazon probably doesn't mind that much if you're not utilizing the resources as long as you pay for them. But nevertheless, it is a, a pretty low number. Um, and in many other companies that we've talked to, we've also found that you know, machine utilizations below 10% are, are not that uncommon. Um, however, the good news is we can actually achieve high utilization. Um, and the, uh, the, the key example there is Google's infrastructure. Um, and if you look at the Borg paper from Eurosys 2015, you actually find that Borg achieves between 60 and 80% actual utilization of the machines, which is significantly higher. I remember reading a Hacker News comment about this when people were discussing the paper, and a bunch of people were saying this is you know, way better than any industry average. So you know, it is really impressive to get to that level. Um, and you know, that, is, that should be the goal, right? That's what we want in order not to waste any resources. So let's take a look at what the state of the art in you know, academic, uh, the academic uh, literature about scheduling is. And this, this is sort of a helpful taxonomy that helps you understand you know, how different scheduler architectures differ and why systems are built the way they are. Um, but it is you know, sort of a more academic and sort of coming from the research papers. Um, so the initial schedulers, if you think about like Hadoop, Yarn, um, you know, some of the very early big data systems, as well as, for example, systems like Borg, are you know, monolithic, um, which is to say you, know, you have a bunch of machines that's like the, the gray uh, squares here, and you have a, a, a workload that consists of different types of jobs, which are the, you know, the circles in red here, uh, so red, blue, and green here. And then you have a single scheduler that is responsible for placing the, uh, these uh, tasks on the machines. Um, and there are a couple of issues with this. One of them is that you know, you're pretty inflexible with your scheduling policy. If the red workload needs very different types of decisions to, to the green workload, then you know, you're still shoving them through a single scheduler, which in practice, this is what, what Google found when, uh, when they uh, evolved Borg, leads to massive code growth because your scheduler becomes more and more complex, more and more sort of special tweaks and flags and things get added in order to uh, to make it uh, cater to all sorts of different workloads that it encounters, and then you know it becomes just hard to manage it from an engineering standpoint. Um, Two-level systems, um, of which Mesos is a, a particular example, um, and in fact the first example, um, sort of solved this problem by indirecting the uh, the resource management to this resource manager bit. So there's uh, a layer in between the actual schedulers that make the decisions and the and the cluster resources, and this resource manager sort of parcels up the cluster dynamically into subsets that get given to the different schedulers. Note that there's now a free separate schedulers and no longer a single scheduler that handles everything. And then each scheduler can make its decisions in whatever way it likes, um, and they can still share the underlying infrastructure. And Mesos calls the schedulers frameworks, um, but they have to actually implement the scheduling. The yellow resource manager really only makes offers. It doesn't make any decisions as to what goes where. Um, and then uh, after a couple of years after the, the two-level model was introduced, uh, the Omega paper from Google introduced the shared state model, um, which is sort of an evolution of the two-level model that um, addresses a couple of shortcomings with the offer-based model, where you take a, a sort of little parcel of the cluster, you offer it to a scheduler, and it can then decide what, uh, what resources it wants out of this little parcel. One problem, for example, uh, that, that the two-level approach has is that uh, you can hide information because each scheduler up there can only see the bit of the cluster that it's been offered. So the green scheduler can only see this little parcel on the right there, and it can't, for example, place a task over here um, because that resource was not offered to it. Um, and there can also be problems with hoarding when a scheduler takes a long time to make decisions. It actually sort of effectively locks a bunch of resources, even if it's not going to claim them in the end. Um, and then other schedulers will have to wait, and that can lead to problems. So the shared state model in Omega is, is one that's based on optimistic concurrency. It basically has a single cluster state, and then it has the different schedulers. They all issue transactions against this cluster state, and these transactions contain sort of scheduling deltas, where you know, the, the scheduler basically says, I would like to place a task on this machine. You know, is that okay? 
and then if there's no nobody else claiming that machine at the same time, you can go ahead. But sometimes scheduling conflicts can occur when two schedulers try to claim the same thing at the same time. Um, and then you have to resolve those. And if you have a lot of them, that could be a problem for, for your scheduler making progress. Um, so this is sort of the traditional view. Um, recently in academia, there have been a bunch of uh, papers published on distributed schedulers. And the main motivation for these things is that um, they are trying to scale the scheduler. So they're trying to uh, support even higher throughput of containers um, because they try to address workloads where each container only runs for a couple of seconds and you have tens of thousands or even millions of them sort of coming in. Um, they, because there are, there are many schedulers around the cluster, you sort of just randomly bounce your request to place a, a task to one of these schedulers, and then that scheduler will make a decision. And likewise, you know, like in the shared state model, it may conflict with other things, then it might have to try again. But in practice, randomization actually works pretty well there. Um, that said, because the schedulers are distributed, they can only use these simple random algorithms. And as a result, the quality of the decisions, they do get made and conflicts are rare, but the quality of the decisions can be really quite poor. So for example, it, this distributed scheduling model may easily put two tasks that both hit the disk very hard next to each other. And then again, you get degradation. Um, so far, this model has been mostly academic. Um, I'm not aware of any industry system that actually works this way. Um, it's also sort of catering to a specific workload um, that I think no, not many people have today. Um, and these papers are more about sort of future workloads where you have very short running tasks. And then there have been a bunch of papers about hybrid schedulers, which are sort of just a combination of the previous models. You have a distributed scheduler here for the blue and the green tasks where we use a distributed scheduler with many instances spread around the cluster that can place things anywhere. But the red high priority workloads actually use a, a single centralized scheduler like in the monolithic model or in the, in the shared state model or in the two level model. And as a result, you, know, you get good decisions for the red workload. You get sort of so-so decisions for the blue and the green. Um, and you know you 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 sort of balance the uh, the scalability against the against the decision quality. Again, this has been mostly academic. I'm not aware of any system that actually does this, um, but it might be you know a future model. Now you might be wondering, so you know my favorite cluster manager, what does it scheduler actually do? Um, and it turns out we actually the existing systems actually cover a fair bit of the space. So Docker Swarm um, is, is a monolithic scheduler. It has a single policy. There's an asterisk there because I know that they're actually working on supporting pluggable schedulers so that you can customize the policy then. As far as I'm aware, not working on supporting multiple schedulers at the same time. Um, you can configure the policy, but it's a one-off choice. You, do, you choose your policy, and then that's what all of your workload gets. All of your containers get this. Kubernetes was originally monolithic. Um, it's now multi-schedular as of version 1.2. You can actually have multiple schedulers, and then you can use labels to differentiate which of the schedulers ends up scheduling your pods. Um, so that's sort of a bit like the two-level model, except there's no resource manager component. You just kind of split the workload to different uh, schedulers. And then Mesos, as I mentioned before, is, a, is the original two-level system. It supports multiple frameworks and therefore multiple schedulers. And Nomad from HashiCorp, which is a relatively new system, is based on the Omega shared state model. Um, it's a little bit different to Omega because it has a centralized planner component, but it's definitely inspired by that model. Um, so that was a general architectural overview. So, you know, what, yeah, and that gives you an idea of why these systems you know, are designed the way, the way they are. For certainly, Mesos is designed in order to support multiple schedulers that make independent decisions, and likewise, Nomad as well. And Kubernetes has moved to a multi-schedular model for the same reason. Um, what I'm now going to cover next is a couple of specific features that individual sh uh, schedulers might apply. Um, this could be your single scheduler if you're in the swarm world, or it could be you know, a specific scheduler of many that, that are running, or multiple that are running on top of your, uh, your cluster manager. The first one is priority preemption. Um, this is actually a super useful feature um, that you know, is very desirable for high utilization. So to show you an example here, on the, on the x-axis we have time. And uh, I'm going to show you sort of snapshots of the cluster as time progresses. So again, here you have your cluster. You're running three different types of workload. You have a high priority service running. You have a medium priority batch workload running. And you have a low priority batch workload running. Um, the low priority one's in blue. The medium priority batch workload's in green. And the high priority service is in red. 
So what happens over time is you, if you want good utilization, you sort of fill your cluster up with batch tasks. And they use idle resources that are not currently required by the red service workload. And as a result, you, know, you get pretty good performance. However, what might happen is that a load spike occurs and your auto scaling kicks in and your service job gets scaled up. Additional web servers get provisioned, additional memcached instances get provisioned in order to cope with the load. And this is exactly what you want your cluster scheduler to do, right? Um, but you have now got into the situation where you filled up your cluster with batch workloads and actually only some of your service tasks that the autoscaler has created can schedule. Um, and you now have this problem that you have leftover service tasks that you really want to run because you need to deal with that load spike, but they can't, they can't run anywhere because there's no space in the cluster. So what you want in this situation clearly is you want to preempt a couple of the low priority batch tasks, kick them out, cancel them, say, all right, you know, you're going to have to try again go over there and make room for the more important workload. Um, this is a crucial feature, by the way, in Borg. If you read the Borg paper, they say in many places, they say very clearly, this is what you need to do in order to get good high utilization at the same time as you know, running different mixed workloads. You want to fill in with low priority, but you want to kick it out when you need the resources. Um, a sort of more general case of this preemption idea is that, that, that you might want to perform rescheduling. Sometimes you might want to revisit your decisions. Sometimes you might want the scheduler to move a container from one machine to another because the place where it originally was scheduled was, is no longer a good fit for it. So for example, if you drain a machine for maintenance, then clearly you're going to have to move the container somewhere else. If you suffer a strong interference from another co-located container, your performance and your, you know, your SLO satisfaction might improve if you move your container somewhere else. Or it might simply be that a better location has become available where you, know, you have access to a GPU or where your input data is locally available or something like that. So you want the scheduler to reevaluate its decisions. And in effect, what this means is that the scheduler actually has to go and, try and schedule the whole workload again. It's not just the new containers. It actually has to think about the entirety of the cluster in order to make its decisions. Um, now we're going to change tack slightly and talk about another feature, which is oversubscription. Um, the running theme of all of these features, as you probably figured, is you know, how can we pack things in into a, a limited amount of resources in the most efficient way possible? And that's what oversubscription is also about. So again, on the x-axis, we have a timeline here. And on the y-axis, um, we have some resource metrics. So let's say it's you know, the reserved RAM on your machine in gigabytes. And the machine, let's say, has a capacity of 64 gigabytes. You can't use more memory than that. If you use more, then you, know, you get out of memory errors and your containers crash. So we, let's say we schedule a service uh, job container that reserves 20 gigabytes. We also schedule one of our batch workloads, and it also reserves 20 gigabytes. And now we would like to schedule another batch task, because there's still plenty of space up there. You know, we still have 20. Oh, my math doesn't quite work out here. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, let's say uh, the, let's say these guys ask for 30 Sorry, gigabytes. Um, the yeah, there's some OS memory as well, and yeah, the, for some reason the blue task does not fit into the machine capacity. So uh, what what happens is effectively you can't place the task there because your fit logic in your in your cluster manager scheduler will say no 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 there's no room on that machine you can't put it there, but you're going to have to wait instead and run it when the green batch task finishes, because now there's space on your machine again, and you can put the, uh, the workload there. But in practice, of course, these reservations are specified by humans. Um, in practice, the user has put in some number. And what happens a lot of the time, actually, is that in practice, really, the service job only uses 12 gigabytes. But the user tried with 10, and it failed, so they, went, they just doubled it and went, and went for 20 instead. Um, but really, you're actually wasting 8 gigabytes there because the service job doesn't actually need 20 gigabytes, and the user was just sort of over generous in what they requested. Um, and likewise, with the batch job, maybe it actually uses 15 gigabytes out of the 20 it asked for. So overall, you're now wasting 13 gigabytes of RAM there because you reserved it, but you're actually leaving it idle. Nobody's ever using it. So what you would like to do is you would like to compress this. You would like to put the green batch task into the uh, the, the slack that the other uh, the service task has wasted, and then you can put the blue batch task on the machine as well. And there's not going to be any out of memory situations because it turns out that actually in practice all of them can run fine. It's just that the users were overly conservative in what they specified. Um, no resources get wasted. This is efficiency, an efficiency gain that comes for free if you get it right. Um, now, what you might also 
uh, of course, realize is that in practice, you know, things don't use the same amount of memory over time. In practice, you're probably going to get something like this, a curve where it goes up and down, um, and likewise for the batch job. So what you want to do is you want to identify or you want your scheduler to identify a ceiling that is safe. You want to realize, you want to set your reservation, your actual reservation, not the one that the user specified, but the one that the scheduler uses. You want to set that to be the ceiling of what you think the task will ever use in practice. Um, and it turns out you can actually get pretty good predictions from historic performance. So what Google do, and they say this in the Borg paper, is they look at um, what, uh, what, what previous instances of similar jobs of the, or, or, or even the same job, what they actually consumed and then derive the ceiling from that. And you can do that very easily with the data you get from a monitoring system like Container, uh, C Advisor, or, or Sysdig or something like that. Um, now, of course, you may not know initially if your workload has changed. So maybe what you want to do is you want to start high and you want to assume that the user was actually right in specifying 20 gigabytes because, you know, sometimes things get recompiled, they start using more memory and, inst and using the previous ceiling is, is not a safe thing to do. So what Google Borg does and what I, I personally believe the right strategy for this is, is to do a, 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 what's called resource reclamation. So you start off assuming that the user got it right and then you sort of slowly degrade your resource reservation towards the actual usage, which you can see with the green line that's sort of going down there with the batch job. And then you keep a safety margin. You sort of you make an envelope that sort of wraps around the actual usage. So if the actual usage goes up, you bump up your reservation a little bit, and then you can derive the ceiling by sort of figuring out what the steady state of this is. Um, uh, yeah, so that was resource estimation and reclamation, and this can be automated completely. Um, the Borg algorithm is the one that I show here. There are many other algorithms that have been looked at in research. You can automate this, and you can actually reclaim all of this slack up here and place tasks there. Ideally, you want to put low priority tasks there. So if you actually have a spike and if the reservations go up, you just priority preempt them, you kick them out, and you make room for the workload that you care about so that the service job always gets what it asked for. Um, now, the final feature I'm going to focus on is one that actually no current scheduler provides, um, but it is super important, which is this uh, <laughs> workload interference, uh, where you have multiple co-located containers from different types of workloads that interact badly with each other. And I'm illustrating this using an experiment here where we ran on a 28-node cluster um, with a random first fit scheduling policy, um, and we ran a bunch of batch processing jobs. Um, on the x-axis, you can see the different types of jobs. There's some image analysis, TPCH database queries, some joins between data sets, the Netflix recommendation algorithm, page rank, you know, typical sort of batch processing workloads. And the runtime here is normalized to the runtime on an otherwise idle cluster. So what we did in the experiment is we ran each job on a completely idle cluster. So it had all the resources to itself, measured how long it took. And then we ran the combination of jobs and we, uh, we looked at how much longer does it take because there's other workloads in the cluster at the same time. And it turns out some things don't suffer very much. For example, the image analysis um, workload that just does a bunch of compute intensive processing on relatively small working sets actually only degrades by about 40% in its runtime, but some batch processing workloads, particularly PageRank, which is very network intensive and ends up sending a lot of coordination traffic, can degenerate by up to 3.2x in the simple experiment uh, compared to what the workload, how long the workload would have taken if you had run it on a completely idle cluster. Um, so by reducing workload interference and by the scheduler making smart decisions about which things can safely be put next to each other, you can actually reclaim something like 3x resources in, you know, in the best case and at least 40% in, in some in, in less good cases. Um, so you might be asking yourself again, you know, what of these fine features actually does my scheduler have? What does my current orchestration system support? Um, I'm going to show you a big matrix here. I'm not going to have time to go through all the details. There's a URL at the bottom where you can look it up. Um, there's a blog post that explains this in, in, in a lot more detail. But basically, the bottom line is um, it depends. Um, and in fact, if you look at the open source systems, which are the ones that are above the, the red line here, um, it turns out the answer is often not very much. Um, so you can see that you know, oversubscription is actually supported in, uh, in Mesos as of uh, a, a recent version, and Kubernetes also has a design doc for it um, and now supports it. But you know, a lot of the space is read. A lot of the features are not supported. Nobody uh, does anything about workload interference. Many uh, systems don't do priority preemption. Many systems don't have support for rescheduling. 
has a big feature gap here compared to the proprietary systems that are down here, Borg, Google's Omega, and Apollo, which Microsoft uses. Um, and they actually, if you read the papers, it turns out they actually have a lot of these features. They don't do workload interference, but they do do the other ones. So yeah, there, uh, there's definitely some uh, catch up that the open source systems have to do in order to get the same efficiency as the proprietary systems. As I mentioned, you know, they generally don't reschedule, they don't estimate resource needs automatically, and they don't handle workload interference. So that brings me to the end of this sort of coverage of cluster scheduling state of the art. Um, and we're now going to talk about Firmament, which is our system that we've developed in, in our research. And I think Yonel is going to take yeah. over from me here. Thanks. So the idea behind Firmament is to model your cluster as and your scheduling problem as a graph problem. Um, just going to skip this slide quickly. And uh, for so for example, in this in this example, we have four machines. Or so for every single machine, we add a node graph. Uh, then uh, these machines are connected as uh, they are part of two racks. Each rack having two machines. For every single rack that you have in your data center, we add another node graph. Finally, there is a special type of uh, node which is called the cluster aggregator, which denotes your entire cluster. Uh, in, in Firmament, we root uh, the flow from the tasks. We root the flow from the task uh, down to the sinks, and by rooting the flow from task to the uh, to the to, uh, to the sink, we end up scheduling the tasks. This is a very general model which allows us to um, express. Uh, various policies, such as if if task one has uh, its input data allocated on machine two, then what we can do is we can add an arc from the task to the machine on which we, on which is input is located, and in this way we can uh, opt, we can potentially schedule the task there and obtain better data locality. Uh, we can add, we can also add arcs to to racks if the task has uh, its input data allocated on several machines. And what we, the way we distinguish between uh, running the task on a particular machine or on a particular, or, or, or between running the task on different machine is by placing costs on the arcs uh, which we use to connect the task to the machines. Um, the nice property of the firmament model is that it um, provides an optimal task placement with regards to, to your graph and to the cost that you, you provided to it. And as well, the model is very, very flexible and general. So for example, we can extend the model to model your machine's cache and CPUs. And later on, if we have time, I'm going to show to you uh, a simple scheduling model that uh, implements network-aware scheduling, which is a feature that from I think is not present in any other scheduler. So now I'm going to hand back to, to Malta. All right. So uh, I mentioned. There we go. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so that was sort of a wheeze through the, the firmament model. I think the base, basically what you want to take away from this is we have this, this graph, which we run an, an optimization algorithm over that ends up making good scheduling decisions. But we also have the flexibility to express many different policies, because depending on how we set up the graph and how we set the costs, you can actually implement different scheduling policies. And in practice, this works by implementing a C++ interface where the scheduler sort of comes to you and asks you, you know, hey, what would you like the cost between this type of node and this type of node to be? And then you just return a number. And as a result, your scheduling policy gets sort of built up. Um, as you see in the results that I will show you in a moment, um, this actually leads to pretty good quality decisions. We can reduce batch task runtime by 2 to 4x. Um, and it's actually, uh, despite being an expensive optimization algorithm that needs to look at a big graph, we've actually made it fast and scalable. And in simulations, we can still make sub-second placement decisions at over 12,500 machines of a simulated Google cluster. So this is the first experiment I'm going to show you. What we are comparing here is firmament against random placement. Random placement is, for example, what you would get from a distributed scheduler. Um, it's also what you get in practice from, uh, from many of the existing systems, um, certainly with regards to network performance, which is what we are looking at here. Um, you do have resource fit models in existing systems that make sure that you don't overfill a machine, but otherwise the placement is, is typically fairly random. You don't actually, the, the scheduler doesn't actually deeply understand the workload. So let me tell you about this experiment here. What we did here we, is we used 40 machines um, in, in a local physical cluster. 
Three of them ran Nginx, which is you know, a typical service workload. We had seven HTTP clients hitting them as hard as they possibly could. And we also had 16 iperf sessions between pairs of machines running, which simulate, for example, a machine learning parameter server. TensorFlow, for example, ends up easily ends up generating 10 gigabits per second of traffic between machines that run its worker tasks and the parameter server. And then we ran 450 batch tasks, which were doing simple batch computations on input data stored in HDFS. So that's, a, for example, something like a Hadoop or a, or a Spark workload. And all the data is stored in HDFS. The graph on the x-axis has the task response time, which is the time in between submitting your task to the, uh, the scheduler and, uh, and the uh, task actually completing. So we are only measuring batch tasks here because the other ones are long running and they don't complete. But the batch task, you know, the time in between when you give it to the scheduler and when it's completed doing its work. And this is a cumulative distribution function. So the further to the left and the straighter you are, the better. If you were sitting in the left-hand corner and this was a straight line, then that would be fantastically ideal. In practice, the tasks all take different amounts of time because they do different amounts of work. So you're not going to get the straight line. Um, but it turns out that Firmament is actually doing pretty well. And specifically, if you look at the tail here, which is what you care about in your batch jobs, because the job completion time is actually determined by when the last of your parallel batch tasks completes, the tail actually improves substantially because we avoid contention on the network. Um, and the contention on the network here is created by these machine learning parameter servers that send lots of data, by the Nginx workloads, just you know, generally the pipe can get full. And a random scheduler that isn't aware of this will end up putting too many tasks on the machine. It will oversaturate the network bandwidth available on this machine. And then the tasks will be slow. So as you can see from the black line to the red line, firmament actually improves on this quite substantially. Now, in the next experiment, um, I'm going to use a different representation because lots of CDFs are kind of hard to read. This is a box and whiskers plot that ends up um, drawing the first 25th, 75th, and 99th percentile, as well as the median as the thick line in the middle and the maximum of the runtime of the task. So as you go towards the right here, if this, as this box and whisker thing becomes sort of denser, you actually get better performance determinism. You get less variation in your runtime. And this is sort of the ideal. If everything was a little line and the stars sat right on top, then you, know, you have perfect determinism. Your tasks always take the same amount of time. Anything that is not this is due to the interference between different tasks that, that run on the machines. So we look at uh, five different workloads here. Um, they are sort of synthetic workloads because we wanted to specifically stress resources and get an idea of how the schedulers deal with this contention. Um, you know, we have a compute bound workload. We have some that just stream through memory. That's, uh, for example, typical of like a Spark task that has a big data set that's in memory and that it's iterating over. And then we have I.O. bound tasks that read and write to disk. Um, and we compare again a random scheduler um, and we'll compare against Mesos as well and then look at Firmament. So you can see with the random scheduler, as you might uh, not be hugely surprised to see, um, the variance is actually super high because you oftentimes get these pathological situations where multiple tasks that are hitting the disk have ended up on the same machine. Um, again, the runtime here is normalized. So this line here at 1x is the ideal runtime on an otherwise idle cluster. So again, we ran this on a completely idle machine. We got the runtime, and that's what we've normalized the runtime to. Um, so anything above is sort of a multiple of the ideal. Um, now let's add Mesos to this. Mesos actually does better than the random placement um, because it uses dominant resource fairness because it actually uh, it distributes the tasks across machines sort of equally um, according to their resource demands. But Mesos does not model network bandwidth or, uh, as a resource. Um, and it does not have any idea of the fact that um, disk bandwidth is also, can also be a contended resource. Um, so when we add firmament to this graph, you can see that actually our, our bars are tiny. They're, they're very close to the ideal. And in fact, in the case of, uh, of the disk-bound workloads, they're almost ideal. In the case of the memory-bound workloads, there's some variance, and that is due to CPU cache sharing between these workloads. Um, but importantly, on the disk workloads, we get a massive improvement over both the random placement and over Mesos. I should point out that Mesos here was not using any particular framework. We were just using the shell executor. But the, using a particular framework would not make a difference because none of the frameworks that I'm aware of at least model uh, I.O. contention or, dis or network contention. And this is the final experiment I'll show you. And then we'll get on to interesting things such as demos. 
Um, we are comparing here firmament against a previous academic system called Quincy, which you probably haven't heard of because it's only a paper. It was a proprietary system developed by Microsoft, but they use the same flow optimization approach to scheduling. Um, so we compare it against Quincy to see you know, how much faster did we make things. Again, this is a cumulative distribution function, so being in the left-hand corner and being straight is good. Um, and what you can see here is that despite the fact that we simulated a very large cluster, 12,550 machines from the publicly released Google Trace, um, and we used the same scheduling policy as Quincy, Firmament actually makes decisions 200 times faster than Quincy, and 98% ends up placing the, uh, the tasks in less than one second. Um, and I should point out the graph that we are optimizing here is huge. This is like tens of millions of nodes and edges. Um, so it is a pretty computationally intensive problem, and we applied a bunch of uh, tricks such as incrementally computing solutions and so on to actually get the, the runtime down. This is sort of the academic contribution of the work, one of the academic contributions of the work. Um, why should you care about this? Well, if you look at the Quincy line, there's 60 second decision times there. Your users don't want to wait for 60 seconds until their container starts running, right? So uh, you, know, you want the scheduler to make decisions quickly. All right. Um, so benefits to users, I already men mentioned. Um, you can customize Firmament. To, uh, you can write a custom scheduling policy that meets your goals. Um, you can make better decisions. You get higher utilization. 20 to 40% improvements are easily doable. And we get good scalability and containers start up faster. Now, you might be wondering, you know, how can I use this? You know, this is some academic research that some guys wrote and you know, stashed away somewhere. Um, so the way that we, uh, that, that, you, that, that we can make this available is by plugging it into existing systems as a pluggable scheduler. Um, and all of the Docker, uh, Kubernetes, and Mesos communities have approached us and have asked us uh, if we can integrate with them. Um, there's a little bit of a constraint here, which is that you know, we're two guys who have uh, academic jobs that we need to do on the side, so we don't, you know, there's unlikely that we will be able to do all of this. Um, we are planning an integration. We have worked on an integration with Kubernetes, but if you want to integrate it with your favorite cluster manager, you know, it's out there on, on GitHub and under Apache license. You know, if you want to help, you know, we'll be super happy and we'll be supporting it as well as we can. Let me talk a little bit about the Kubernetes integration because that's what I can demo to you at the end of the talk. Um, our Kubernetes integration is called Poseidon, and it's basically the firmament you know, sort of concept, the firm core firmament scheduling code integrated with Kubernetes. We actually originally developed Firmament as a standalone cluster manager, but it's a research cluster manager. It's not as production hardened, hardened as the systems that are out there. So that, uh, therefore, it makes sense for us to integrate with something that people already use. This is also on GitHub. You can check it out. Um, you can try it yourself. The way it works is uh, Kubernetes actually makes this, uh, makes this very easy and, and was a nice target for this integration because in Kubernetes, the scheduler itself is pluggable. It just runs as a container that you can replace with something that exposes the same API. So what we do is actually we get rid of the default scheduler, cube scheduler, and instead we bring in Poseidon, um, which interacts with the Kubernetes API server just in the same way as the normal cube scheduler does. So the API server can't tell that anything has changed, but we actually have brought in a new scheduler which interacts with our firmament library that does all this graph optimization stuff that I uh, that you now told you about. So uh, the way you you actually get this up and running in Kubernetes, and you can try this at home if you're interested, is you know, you start Kubernetes up on your local machine. Um, you kill the default scheduler, which is a process called P uh, cube scheduler, just make it go away. Then you pull our Docker image and you start it up. And then at that point, Poseidon will be ticking along and will be making scheduling decisions in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, now, I don't know how we're doing for time, but I can demo this to you if you're interested. All right, let's, let's do it. Um, all right. Okay, it's over here. Okay, good, it's still running. All right, let's bring up the Kubernetes cluster. Waiting for the API server to come up. There we go, it's up and running. Now, we don't have any pods. We do have a node that's not yet ready, so we're gonna have to wait until it actually becomes ready. That typically takes a few seconds. Um, meanwhile, we can already get uh, Poseidon ready here. Uh, start up. All right, uh, so it's seen a new node here. You can see add new node, resource ID, um, and it got zero scheduling deltas because there are currently no outstanding pods. There's nothing to schedule in the cluster. Now, 
let me add some workload. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Let's try here. Yes, that is what I want to do. So this is a typical Kubernetes um, you know, scheduling request. I just want to deploy an Nginx service with a single pod for now. So let's do that. Um, and what you're gonna see when you do get pods is that it is now running. Um, that's because I still had the default cube scheduler running. So let's kill it. Um, okay, so now if we check scheduler, there's no cube scheduler running. The rest of Kubernetes is still going. But if I now support, if I now submit another pod, another Nginx pod, it is still going to get scheduled. Uh, let's give it a different name. All right. Um, so let's do get pods and see what happened. It's pending. I hope it actually moves to running. Uh, where's my Poseidon? Okay, got zero scheduling deltas. It only pulls every 10 seconds, so maybe let's wait for a moment until it pulls again. Okay, oh, bad luck today. Um, uh, the node did show up in the beginning, yeah. Um, let me restart it. Oh, I'm gonna have to kill the container. Docker PS. Uh, on descending colon, there we go. All right, now it's gone. Let's start it again. Yep, there we go, it worked. I'm not sure why it didn't work before, but it says bound Nginx to this node. Um, and uh, you can see here the scheduling delta coming in as well. Um, we have a task ID, there's a resource ID, and the type of the delta is place. So Poseidon has made a scheduling decision there. Um, if you want to see how this actually worked out in the flow graph, um, this, this graph that I mentioned earlier, you can see that as well. Um, oh, there we go. So this is a tiny graph because we only have one node here, but you can see there's the sync that you now mentioned. There's a resource that represents the node, and here's the task that represents our Nginx uh, pod, and that ended up sending its flow via this node, which ended up scheduling it. Um, no, and the costs here in this case are, are very simple. It's just a cost of five to remain unscheduled and a cost of zero to schedule. So it made sense for the optimizer to choose that, that you should schedule. Um, I guess we can wrap up there. Um, I have another demo. Um, we have another demo of, uh, of Firmament itself, which has a few more features because Poseidon is currently a very early prototype, but you can come and find me afterwards if you want to see that demo. Um, so to recap what I've told you about in this talk is that current cluster schedulers are somewhat basic, especially the open source ones. Um, they're monolithic, some of them are monolithic. They're fairly inflexible as far as changing the scheduling policy is concerned. They're slow and they lack a bunch of useful features for higher utilization. I've shown you that better solutions are possible and that Firmament actually has many attractive properties. I didn't have time to talk about, for example, Firmament support for resource reclamation, for resource estimation, for priority preemption, but we do actually support these things in, in our model. Um, Poseidon does not yet support them, but you know, these features will come into Poseidon as we, as we port them from the research code. Um, so yeah, it's coming. We have a Kubernetes port that is in progress. Um, we've talked to Mesos, uh, the Mesos and Docker communities about porting to, to their solutions as well. It's a little bit harder to do for Docker because they don't currently support pluggable schedulers in Swarm, but they've said that they are going to support this in the future. Um, all of this is open source. If you go to our website, firmament.io, there's links through to our GitHub repositories and to more detailed descriptions of this work. You know, if you want to get involved, you know, we'd be happy to, uh, to have your help. Um, you know, we, we started doing this as academic research. We never expected it to actually be, uh, you know, adopted in the real world, but there's been tremendous interest. So, you know, we're very pleased. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask. I'll be around. I actually have to run back to MIT for a bunch of meetings later, but I'll be around at the meet hall tonight as well. All right. Thank you very much.